let me ask you a very important question. How many of you last night ate dinner with friends? Maybe at your house, or maybe you went to a friend's house. Let me see those hands. Show your hands. Did you eat dinner with friends last night? If you went to somebody's house, or you had somebody over to your house for dinner, friends of yours eating, then guess what? You did exactly the same thing the night before Palm Sunday that Jesus did. We're going to read through the story, and my goal today is to, to put us into story in a sense of understanding what was happening in the story, what was happening before the crucifixion, what is Palm Sunday. And so we must understand that that Saturday night before Palm Sunday, Jesus, the Bible is going to tell us, is having dinner with friends. John chapter 12, verse 1 and following. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. Remember that. Verse 2. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. So that night they're having dinner. Who's there? Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus, the same one who had been raised from the dead. But before we go any further, I want to make sure that we understand what is Passover. Because, see, everyone there is coming. They're coming through Bethany. The Jewish people are starting to congregate. They're heading to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And this is where our story picks up. But what is Passover? Passover. You have to go all the way back to the Old Testament. The nation of Israel is in captivity. Pharaoh's in charge. They are in Egypt, and Moses is going to lead them out. There's all kinds of plagues. Pharaoh says, no, I will not let your, your people go. They're going to stay here as my slaves. Finally, God sends the death angel, and Moses tells Pharaoh, he said, listen, the death angel is coming. And the firstborn oldest son in every home will be killed unless there is blood put over the doorpost. We have a picture of it here on the wall. The doorpost for their homes, they're going to put blood on the doorpost. They are slaves in Egypt and the death angel is coming. Pharaoh's like, what are you talking about? I'm not doing that. Moses goes and tells the people of God, the nation of Israel, listen. We're going to sacrifice a lamb, and then you're going to take that blood, and you're going to look, put it on the doorpost, because tonight, the death angel is going to come through. And if you want the death angel to pass over your home, then the death angel will have to see the blood, the commitment that you are followers of the one true God. And so this is Passover for the nation of Israel. This is Passover for the Jewish people. So now we pick up the story here, and they are coming from all over. They're coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. They're going to celebrate when their ancestors were released out of Egypt. They're going to celebrate that they did not lose their firstborn oldest son. They're celebrating that they were delivered out of slavery. In a sense, the blood was put over the doorpost and they woke up the next day and they were released out of slavery. We know that we're celebrating Passover, crucifixion and it's the blood of Jesus that's not going to release us from slavery but releases us and forgives us of our sin. So the Jewish people are coming to celebrate that. Well, while they're coming, they hear about this incredible miracle that Jesus, Joseph and Mary's son, who for the last three years has been preaching and teaching and doing some healings and doing some crazy miracles, but more importantly, he's been teaching that he is the long-awaited coming Messiah. And just a little while ago, he raises Lazarus from the dead. And so now Lazarus, who's been raised from the dead, is now sitting with Jesus. He's talking with Jesus. They're having dinner and people are beginning to understand Lazarus, the one raised from the dead, is at Jesus's. Was at uh, Mary and Martha's house with Jesus. The Jewish crowds are coming. Verse nine. Then a large crowd of Jews learned he was there. They came, and this is incredible. 
They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus. Remember that, because that's where we're going to hang out at the end of the message. The one he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest had decided to kill Lazarus also because he was the reason Because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. Did you catch that? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the the Jewish leaders, they're actually going to put a hit out on Jesus. Matter of fact, they're thinking of killing Jesus mafia style on this Sunday. We got to get rid of him. And oh, by the way, we're going to take out Lazarus too. So they are making plans to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Why? Because people, the Jewish people, were leaving their Jewish religion And now they were following the one who they thought was the Messiah. And now Lazarus has been raised from the dead. You remember that story. Mary and Martha give word to Jesus. Your friend Lazarus is sick. Jesus waits three days to get there. He finally shows up. And Mary and Martha are like, hey, Jesus, great, but you're a little late. He's like, no, 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 we're going to raise him from the dead. They're like, no, 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 no. Dude, he stinks. He's been dead for three days. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He has new life. And not only does he have new life, people are seeing it. And they're testifying about it. And Lazarus is talking about it. And as we read the account in John right here, we begin to see that people are coming to Jesus, to meet Jesus, to listen more to Jesus. Why? Because of Lazarus. Because of Lazarus and his new life. They are now coming to see Jesus. They're starting to put things together. We've been waiting for the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph and Mary's son, he's been saying that he's the Messiah. He's been saying, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. He's been doing some stuff, and that dude raised somebody from the dead. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. I was there. It says right here that the people were there. They saw Lazarus come from the dead. They know he had been dead for three days. They're talking. Who doesn't like it? The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees. People are leaving the Jewish religion. They're pointing towards Jesus. They're coming and starting to follow Jesus. So we got to kill Jesus. we got to kill Lazarus too. So this is what is happening. And the crowds who were coming to Passover have now heard the story of Lazarus. They've now seen the story of Lazarus. They've talked to people who were there when the stinky guy came out. And now Jesus is going from Bethany down to Jerusalem too. And they're like, this is the guy. Verse 12. The next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They took palm branches. Why is that? Well, in those days, if you laid out palm branches... For someone coming into town, it was a sense of royalty, a conquering uh, uh, commander of a military, a conquering king would come in on a horse. But the Old Testament talked about that when you came into town and riding the donkey, you were coming in in a sense of peace. So Jesus coming in on a donkey as was foretold. And now the Jewish people... Is he the Messiah? He raised Lazarus from the dead. Let's go see Jesus. And now they're in a fervor. Now they're saying, this is it. And here comes the one who had raised Lazarus from the dead. Here comes the one who was, who was saying that he was the Messiah. And so now they're laying down palm branches. So you need to know. That's why you have Palm Sunday. They're laying down palm branches while his donkey comes into Jerusalem in a sense of, This is the promised Messiah. And they kept shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now you need to know, Hosanna is not a name. Hosanna is their word that means Lord or God, save us now. God, save us now. You see what's happening? He rose Lazarus from the dead. That's an incredible story. 
And he's claiming to be the Messiah. So this must be it. This is God. He is coming back. This is our Messiah. Lay down the palm branches. And then they're shouting to Jesus, Lord, save us. Lord, save us now. That's what the word Hosanna means. It's not a name. Lord, save us. Save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young uh, young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, quoting from the Old Testament. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and they had done these things to him. So when John is writing this many years later, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's telling us parenthetically that while this was going down, this is cool, this is happening, they didn't understand it fully. Looking back, John's writing and saying, after the crucifixion and resurrection, Man, it all came and made a whole lot of sense to us. So here are the people. They know their Old Testament prophecies. John records what they said, and they are hearkening back as Jewish people to Psalms 118, which says this. This is the the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Hosanna. Lord, please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. So these Jewish people, they're coming for Passover. They're starting to put everything together. They're laying down palm branches. And they're saying, Lord, save us. But then they also go to Zechariah 9, which is also a prophecy. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion is the people of, of Israel, the nation of Israel. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble, and riding on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of a donkey. And so they see this happening, and they're saying, you are the one. Again, people were talking about Lazarus. People were talking about Jesus. But as I was reading through this story, it kind of dawned on me. The people knew the prophecies. They were coming to Passover, but it was Lazarus changed life. It was the visual life of Lazarus. It was the verbal life that uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha and people who saw it, they are, are, are talking. What are they talking about? They're talking about this new life. You see, we need to understand That when people are watching our lives and they see something different, when they see something that has changed, they are going to talk. I've said this before. I've raised both of my boys saying this to them. Listen, when you leave high school, when you leave the church you grew up in, when you leave the community, when you leave school, whatever, when you leave where you have been living People are going to talk about you. They're going to talk about you. You determine what they say while you're there. Because people are going to talk. You shouldn't be talking. They're going to talk. They're going to talk about you. You determine what they say. They were talking about Lazarus. What were they saying? That dude was dead. And now he's alive. He was dead for three days. I talked to Uncle Harry. He was there. He saw it. The dude came out. They unwrapped him. He was dead. Let's go talk to Lazarus. And they go and talk to Lazarus. The Bible says that he was sharing his story. And then they were sharing their story that they were also beginning to live out. Verse 17. Meanwhile, the crowd, which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. They continued talking about what they had seen. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. So as we focus on Jesus, as we focus on Palm Sunday, I want to take the lens of the focus just for today, just for a little bit, and move it over to Lazarus. 
Because the Bible says here in John that people were coming to listen to Jesus because of Lazarus. People were coming and seeing Jesus for who he said he was and claiming to be because of Lazarus. The story of Lazarus was going around and people were talking. They were clamoring. Something's going down. So much so again, the religious leaders were killing Jesus and were going to kill Lazarus. You know why they didn't kill him? Mafia style on Sunday? Too many people. You can read through the whole story. Too many people. They tell each other there's too many people. We can't take him out. These fools just said that he's their coming king, that he's their Messiah. They're laying down palm branches. We can't take them out just yet. And when we do take them out, we got to take that guy out too. We have to take out Lazarus. So let's go back to what seems a subplot to the Palm Sunday story and begin to ask ourselves some questions. Again, the visual and the verbal testimony of the story of Lazarus is what creates much of the desire to not just go straight to Passover, but let's go over to Bethany. And Jesus, who's coming from Bethany, is also coming to Jerusalem. And let's go investigate. Let's go see. And so when you take a step back from the story and then you put a focus on Lazarus, all of a sudden you see that a changed life, someone who in a sense, as Jesus had already told Nicodemus, had been born again, Lazarus was dead in the tomb for three days. You'll see that again in a week. Lazarus was dead in the tomb for three days. He's now, in a sense, been born again. He has this new life, new life caused by Jesus, and it is his new life. And my guess is, can you imagine? Lazarus didn't wake up out of the tomb, and everyone's telling him, dude, first of all, you stink. Second of all, you've been dead for three days. And he begins to hear this. And then he knows. He's been given a second chance at life. He has been given new life. This is incredible. What do you think he did? What do you think Lazarus did with that new second life? What do you think he did? Do you think he went back and did the same thing that he used to do? Do you think he just became the same person Or do you think he lived with a new vigor? Do you think he lived? We know that he was talking a lot. We know people were testifying about it. My guess is, because people are going to talk about you, my guess is that he was living a lot of his life in a different type of way. Even if he wasn't some horrible sinner, my guess is he had some type of, of spring in his step. There was something about him that as he went to town, as he went back to work, as he was living his life, my guess is he was telling everybody about his new life. That's just my guess. We do know, because the Bible said so, that everyone was talking about what they were seeing in Lazarus. So here comes the question. As we prepare for Holy Week, we're Christians. As we prepare for Good Friday and Easter, this is the weekend, much like the Jews had Passover, this is the weekend that if the biggest thing on your mind right now is when you're leaving for spring break, you've missed what this weekend means. If the biggest thing is bunnies and and, and, and Easter egg hunts, which we should do and you can do, but if it's the greatest thing you're thinking about, then I feel like we need to refocus. Because what we're getting ready to celebrate, which starts today, is Palm Sunday. If it's true, and me and you have accepted the truth, then this is the biggest weekend. This is the biggest weekend because this is the resurrection power. And without, Paul says, without resurrection power, you and I have no chance of salvation. So let me ask you a question. 
Does the life you live as a Christian, talking about those of us who are Christians, lead people to seek out the one who changed you? I was not going to go in this direction. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about my own life, the more I thought about our lives, as more I thought about Christianity today in America, I thought, you know what? As we're heading into Good Friday and then Easter, we should ask ourselves, if I'm a Christian, does my Christian life, the way I live my life, does it make people, do they want to go and learn more about Jesus? Do they see the way I used to live and now how I live and go, I need to find out who and what and why that person changed? Some of you are like, well, I've been a Christian a long time, but wasn't that bad before that. Okay, thought about that one too. Is your Christian life the one that we say follows after the word of God? that has the highest priority of the gospel, that understands the love that Christ had for the local church and its mission, is how we live our Christian life here on this earth so compelling and so different from the other people who maybe aren't Christians, that people see our lives and they're like, no mistake about it. That couple, the ones there on the cul-de-sac, they're absolutely Christians. I can tell by where their cars go on the weekend. I can, tell, I can tell by the way they treat people. I can tell by this or that when they talk, what they do, what they don't do. All of these things, I can tell by watching that their life is different. Is our lives as Christians so different that it forces people to walk and see truth. So here's what we need to understand. We don't come to Jesus. Unfortunately, this has been too much of the American Christian culture. We don't come to Jesus. We don't get involved in the local church. We don't read our Bible. We don't pray just to get some nuggets of truth to help our life be a little bit better. I need a nugget of truth. Jesus said to be a peacemaker. So I'm going to be a peacemaker today. Jesus said to raise my kids this way, so I want to raise my kids. I just need some nuggets of truth. Now, do we get teaching that's true that changes how we act? Absolutely. But we don't come to Jesus. We don't come to church for some nuggets of truth. We come to Jesus so that he can radically transform our life from the inside out. This is on Sunday morning. This isn't a conference where you come to get some nuggets of truth. When your home team meets, let's just get some nuggets of truth. And again, I understand what that means. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to learn some things. Absolutely. But I think we've turned the Christian life into picking and choosing some nuggets of truth that I like to apply here and like to apply here instead of a complete transformation. I once was dead and now I'm alive in Christ. I've been born again. Do people see our lives, especially in today's culture, and know, oh yeah, that person follows Jesus Christ? First of the year, like a lot of people, I thought I need to go back to the gym. I literally have not been back in the gym working out since I tore my bicep in the summer of 2016, spiking a ball like a machine at summer camp. And as I spiked it, did it, pff, tore it. Really hadn't been doing, hadn't, hadn't done a whole lot. Done some push-ups, but I'm getting a little bit older now. So I didn't get back in the gym. Well, someone told me about the crunch over here in Matthews that's opened up. And I love it because it cost me 24 cents to get in. And it's like $8.49 a month. Like, it's incredible. There's got to be a hidden fee somewhere. I keep waiting for the hammer to drop. But for less than I can get a Big Mac, I can go to the gym for a month. So I've been going to the gym. And I go at different times. I'm trying to get a regular schedule. But I go at different times with my schedule. And it's close enough, which is why I want to go there. It's close enough here in, in Matthews with this kind of promotion. They should, probably should give me a free membership anyway. 
I can get there close, I can get there fast, and I go at different times. Well, I've noticed that when I go into the gym, there's some dudes. I mean, there's some guys who are jacked. I mean, they are cut, they are ripped, and they're just the guys who walk around the gym, and you don't wonder. I wonder if that guy comes once a week. Matter of fact, there's like four or five. Doesn't matter when I go there, they're there. I'm like, do you guys live here? I mean, they are ripped. You hear them talk. You know, I go in, I try to do everything in one, one, one hour. You hear them talk like, y'all was here for four hours today, and all I did was, was arms. I'm like, all you did was arms? I'm knocking everything out in 45 minutes. I'm out. And then there's other people in there like me. You look at me like, yeah, you just came back too. You look at that guy, and you're like, yep, just like me, you're here about 45 minutes, then you're hitting the sauna. You're hoping to make it here two or three days a week, maybe four, for maybe an hour, and you're pretty much just trying to not die too early. You can tell those guys. What's the point? When I walk into the gym, if I took you with me, and I showed you the, 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 the jacked up dudes, there's nobody who doubts that they don't eat well. There's nobody who looks at them and says, Oh, I don't think they work out. Everybody's like, that dude works out all the time. He probably lives here. He probably only eats vegetables. I can tell by looking at what he is. I can tell by looking at his body, his muscles. He's in shape. I know what kind of life he lives. I know his dedication based on what I see. The parallel is easy to make. That's what we're talking about. Do we live a Christian life that when we're walking our kids to carpool, when people just get to know us just a little bit, when they hang out with us because our kids are in the same sports together, the same dance together, or we're doing whatever. They came over to your house last night for dinner. People who just get to know you a little bit Do you stand out enough that people know that you are a Christian? Unmistakably a Christian. What makes us different? Especially in today's culture, where pretty much everybody says they're a Christian. In today's culture, where so many things can get a pass, is our life unmistakably Christian, Jesus, that after people watch for a little while and they see you respond to tragedy, they see you respond to challenges, they see what you do with your life, there's something there and they say, I will go and see and talk to People about Jesus. I'll ask questions about Jesus. Does that make sense? It was astounding to me. And I've read through the Bible multiple times, especially the Easter story. And it came off the pages again. The Pharisees, the Sadducees who crucified Jesus, they put a hit out on Lazarus. That's the kind of thing they were seeing his life. We got to take that dude out. He's taking people away from our religion and following Jesus. We got to take that guy out. Do we live a Christian life as we're heading towards Good Friday and Easter? That if you invited a friend to come with you to Easter, they wouldn't just chuckle. <laughs> You go to church? Oh, yeah, of course I do. But they would know. That, guy, that person goes. Maybe as we head into Passion Week and Easter, we get a better grasp on what God has done for us in our new life. This born again. And then the last thing is that we ask ourselves, what stage am I on right now? that people can see my life. Where has God put me? 
We go to the names on the wall. I always go to the left because it's just, I don't know, I go to the left. So I'm going to go to the right. So go to the right. Go to the right over here. We put all these names over here on the right. And there's a lot of names there. And, and you, you, we all put our name. We, we, we wrote them up there. So the question is, I don't know who wrote this. I'm just picking one out. Autumn. Autumn. The person who wrote Autumn's name up there, is that person not perfect? Don't hear me say that. Is that person following Christ close enough? Is the life changed enough, born again, that as the person is praying for Autumn and then invites Autumn to Easter, invites Autumn to a coffee and say, hey, you ever heard the Easter? I'm going to read through the Easter story. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. That Autumn would be like, you know what? I've been watching you. You can tell me about Jesus because I see the difference that he has made in your life. Please tell me about Jesus. That's what we're talking about. When we put these names up here, and especially in our Christian culture in America, is our life so different that as people are talking about it, the people who hate Christianity begin to not like you. And the people who need Christianity, who need Jesus, see your life. And so they're drawn, watch this, they're drawn to investigate Jesus because of your life. I felt compelled on this Palm Sunday. The focus is absolutely Jesus. But pan over here. Jesus is on the donkey, Hosanna, palm branches. Somewhere on the road from Bethany to Jerusalem, there's Lazarus, hands in his pocket. There he is. And Lazarus looks around. He's like, you know, before I died and was resurrected, before I was born again, <laughs> nobody gave me any attention. Nobody even looked at me. There's crowds of people standing behind me looking at my life to get a better focus of Jesus. Is your life one that people can look at your life? And then by looking at your life, their gaze has to go to Jesus. And then it's up to them of what they do with it, which is the last point as we head into uh, uh, Good Friday. I start thinking about, I always, I'm just weird. I, I, put, I, I look at the story. And I start thinking about people. What are they doing? What made these people go from Hosanna? Let's go look after and look at uh, uh, Lazarus and Jesus. Oh, yeah, palm branches, Hosanna, Lord, save us. To early Friday morning, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That's a little weird. It's a little schizophrenic. What happened for this to happen. And so at the time remaining, I thought about this too. You see, the exciting and the miraculous, the fun, the crazy, can draw people to applaud Jesus. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Jesus. When things are fun, when they're exciting, different, wild, they will applaud Jesus. But only a true understanding of our sin and our need for Jesus takes us away from the applause and then says, you know what? I need to accept Jesus. That's what happened from Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Lord, save us now. Do what you do for us, what you did for Lazarus, to yeah, crucify him. Just 
a couple days. And so here's what I also want to say about us as we think about our life, this changed life. Our changed life doesn't have to be perfect. But for people to see the reality of who Jesus is, if it's all just hype, if it's all just wow stuff, they'll applaud Jesus for a little while. And then when their life gets tough, when things don't go perfect, we've been talking about this in the prayer series, after a while we get tired of applauding and they just leave. But once we applaud Jesus, that's incredible, and then accept Jesus, then this leads to eternal salvation. I think there's a lot of people who had some type of Christian experience. They know some things about it. But for whatever reason, they moved away. Coming this Easter, we want to live our life in the difficult times, in the hard times. That when the applause goes down, the acceptance is then real and vibrant.